Good day, everyone out there in the podcast verse. This is Dawn in the treehouse coming at you with the Uncommon Cast. And today we have a friend in the treehouse with us, which is super exciting. Cody, you want to introduce our friend? Yeah, Marcus Watson, a uh, friend of uh, all of ours. But I, I met Marcus when uh, we were working together at Flourish San Diego. Yeah. And uh, we just became good friends. We're both Enneagram nines, oh, so yeah, we get right. along really well. Right. And we're both nerds. <laughs> we're both nerds. <laughs> so. Tell us about and, yourself. A well, bit. Uh, I'm excited to be here because Cody told me we get to talk about Star Wars the whole time, right? False. Uh, False. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so I'm a pastor, um, a Presbyterian pastor. Been doing that for, I don't know, 15 or more years. And um, currently at a teeny tiny little church way out in the middle of nowhere, some would say, the Imperial Valley of California, Westmoreland, California, and uh, totally different context than I've ever been in uh, because it's agricultural. They're all retired farmers or in some way related to the agricultural industry. And so anyway, just totally different. Um, But I love it Um, anyway, because it's new and they're learning and they're growing and um, uh, anyway, so that's that. And then I also uh, have a podcast that uh, I do called Spiritual Life and Leadership. I like to talk about um, kind of integrating our inner life and our outer life as leaders. And um, so there you go. Didn't, you, didn't someone like really cool design your logo? That's oh, yeah. Like really awesome Man, person. this guy, his name is Cody Vermillion. <laughs> 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 he designed my logo. And, uh, I liked that one. That's, whole, yeah. that's why I brought it up. And uh, and uh, shared with me after he had designed it, and I liked it. He said, "Oh, by the way, the font is called Marcus Inc." And I was like, "Perfect!" So <laughs> I love that <laughs> little, little Easter egg. Easter egg. <laughs> well, hey, we uh, <laughs> every this is Ryan, by the way, and we are bringing up for Marcus right now. Um, we're maxing out the pulley and the basket because we're I'm bringing excited. up what? bubbles and mm. bubbly and Fruit Loops. And for fruit loops. for today's podcast, Ooh. and uh, there's lots of options of flavors. Here's a peach pear, and then really the Fruit Loops are just for you to put into a cup and uh, oh, I see. And, and enjoy and go dry, awesome. or you can pour you can pour sparkling your water into if you it. want. Yeah. What? I, I wouldn't suggest that, Marcus. I'm just throwing like, it out like, like, as an thing? option. Is that a thing? There there are no rules. <laughs> there are no rules That's about good. this. So. Good. Did you build this thing too? Yes. You gotta so build the cool. pulley to get. I guess you had to, to get it. snacks to your children. That is so awesome. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not used as frequently as I would have imagined. Okay. We use it though. We use it. <laughs> build yeah. it for your kids. Use it for a podcast. Yeah, there Welcome you go. to Uncommon Good. Thank you, Marcus. Great Cheers. to have you here this morning. <laughs> so, for the summer, we've been exploring this theme of. Um, Sacred and secular, okay. which as we've discussed before, secular is really a word that only church people use, but they basically use it to describe anything that they don't consider quote unquote holy or churchy. So it's like yeah. sacred is churchy things, yeah. church music, church people, church yeah. talk, church concepts. Uh-huh. And then we tend to use the concept of secular yeah. to describe everything else. Yeah, And, uh, that has created all sorts of beliefs and understandings and ways of being in our current context, in our current culture. And part of what we do at Uncommon Good is dive into areas that maybe uh, culture has gotten some things wrong or church has gotten some mm-hmm. things wrong and name them and try to reframe them. Yeah. And so one of the ones we've been tackling this summer is this idea of sacred and secular or yeah. holy and everything else. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so... We know you have a lot to say on that. I mean, as 15 years as a pastor, that creates a lot of insight and a lot of baggage around this topic, particularly, right? right? Yeah. Um, So, yeah, we just wanted to invite you into this conversation with us and hear what you have to share. Okay. Uh, Well, let's see. Um, So where to start on that? (laughs) It's a small Um, topic, really. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so let's start with this. I, um, so... uh, just my my own personal um, journey a, in terms of thinking about this. Um, so I became a pastor after, for many, many years, resisting becoming a pastor. Uh, not what I wanted to do. I wanted to 
work in Hollywood <laughs> and do that. And I did for a couple of years as a production assistant, which is bottom of the totem pole. But um, that was fun. But then um, anyway, uh, realized that um, uh, really that wasn't my calling. So I ended up working in churches, ended up becoming a pastor and what man wanted wanted to be a really great pastor, right? Wanted my churches to be really awesome, whatever church I was working at, to be really awesome. And so I put a lot of effort in all of these sacred things, right? Um, uh, and and f- I had this moment at my last church because, okay, it's really hard um, to get people to be spiritual, right? Um what do you mean by that? Yeah, um, that's a good question, right? So the goal is to help people grow in their faith. But for for me, that was my goal. Uh, but it was also to look really good as a mm. pastor, right? Mm-hmm. And to for my church to look really good. And so the best way to look really good was to have lots of people there on Sunday mornings and to have them participate in all kinds of programs and... Uh, the thing that would get communicated is, hey, if you want to be a spiritual person, you need to come to these things here, right? And in the back of my mind, and that will help me to look good, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so there's this inner uh, tension. Um, So, yeah, so so I did that. Um, That was kind of uh, you know, it's not like I didn't care about people. Of course, I cared about people. I wanted people to really grow in their faith. Um, and then at my last church, uh, things fell apart uh, near the end and uh, got really toxic. You know, there were weird accusations, and I ended up getting voted out of my last church, right? And that kind of threw everything um, out of whack for me. Like, I was just like, I, I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and so... Uh, I started to rethink, okay, what is it that really matters? Because I feel like I've been focusing on, on things that really, when it comes right down to it, doesn't matter. Then I ended Mm -hmm. up working for Flourish San Diego with Cody and, um, and I learned a lot there. That was a great place for me to go for a couple of years. It was a very healing place. Um, it was a good place for me to not be in a church, um, as a pastor, because that had been so painful the last year or so that I, I had been at my last church. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I learned a lot there, too, about, uh, we talked about vocation, um, our callings, and, and that everything is uh, is spiritual, right? Um, whatever work you do is your way of participating with God in the restoration of the world, right? So if you are... Um, you know, some of the easy ones, if you're a teacher, well, you're bringing healing and wholeness and confidence and knowledge into the lives of children or adults, whatever you teach, right? Mm-hmm. If you're a mechanic, you are uh, restoring the world for me by fixing my car so I can go to work and provide for my family and and keep my family healthy, right? That's part of the healing and the, I like to use the word shalom, the shalom that God wants for the world. So, can you explain what that means? Oh, shalom, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so I, I define shalom as, and I got this somewhere else, I don't remember where, but a comprehensive state of well-being that touches every aspect of life. So, mm. um, right, the Hebrew word shalom uh, literally means peace, yeah. but it's not just the absence of hostility, it's... Um, the presence of wholeness. Yeah, the presence of, of wholeness, right? Yeah. It has this sense of completeness, that it's complete, There, there's no brokenness, Right. And so, and it's comprehensive. It's not just your spiritual life, but it is that, right? But it's also your physical life, your um, uh, relationship life. It's your community life. It's um, it's your, uh, you know, mental your health. emotional mental health, yeah. right? All that of that holistic harmony. Holistic. It's every aspect, right? And so, um, uh, where was it going with that? Uh, oh, and so, right, we're called... Right, restoration is bringing shalom. Right, through uh, all the ordinary things that we do, right? And so we've created this division uh, in the church, and I was absolutely 100% guilty of this, between the sacred things we do mm-hmm. and the secular or ordinary things mm-hmm. that we do, right? And man, and I think uh, I think we're missing it, right? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I used to hear this pastor, and he's changed his mind on this since then, but I heard him say once, this hour, right, when you're at church, is the most important hour of your week. And, uh, and then I heard him say years later, you know, I've changed my mind on that, <laughs> which is great. Good <laughs> yeah. for him. Right. Um, because it's not. It's, a good, it's, a, it's an important, I mean, whatever hour you, you, you use or have to spend time in fellowship with friends and, uh, you know, fellow followers of Jesus or whatever, you know, and, and in worship. And that's important, sure, but it's not necessarily the most important. Every hour is an important hour because you uh, are participating with God in the healing of the world yeah. through whatever ordinary things you might be doing. So talk mm. for a minute about what that shift means. What does that shift mean for... Uh, you potentially as a pastor, mm -hmm. but almost more importantly, what does that shift mean for um, the ordinary average person that is just trying to, you know, yeah. do their best in life? Okay. So let me start as a pastor. Uh, and then if I forget to go to the second part, yep. then remind me. Okay. <laughs> so I think, um, uh, and this is really hard. It's still hard for me because I'm still in kind of a traditional church and we have that one hour of the week that is very important to a lot of people, but um, uh, it's really hard to get out of that mindset, right? Again, partly because uh, we tend to f find our self-worth on how well that one hour per week goes, mm -hmm. right? So that's a challenge, right? How do you, uh, how do you, how do you let go of that? And how do you, um, how do you explore other ways of, uh, of being the church, right? And so that, that requires some openness. It requires some surrender, I think, as a pastor, right? I kind of being, I like the language that Moses uses, being open-handed, not tight-fisted, right? Being open-handed, okay, Lord, I'll receive or try or, you know, be open to whatever new things, you know, you might be inviting me and us to, to try, as opposed to holding on tight-fistedly right. to the things of the past or the, the way we've always done things. So there's that. And then for, for people, that's the second part of the question, um, for the people in our, our churches, um, right, an understanding of the sacredness of everything that they do, I think, expands their world, I think. Um, and, and a decompartment. Did we talk about that before or after? Uh, de compartmentalization. I can't remember. We talked about it before, before the podcast. So you, you yeah. talked about compartmentalization, the way we com compartmentalize our spiritual lives and our work life and our family life and all, right, right. all these different aspects of our life. If we can recognize that everything is sacred, everything that we do, right? Then all of a sudden, oh, God is in every part of my life and not just the church things that I do, right? right? Things um, become much more integrated. Yeah, yeah. And so, then, so see, so um, the typical process of, you know, uh, discipleship of Christian word, right, which means uh, just helping people become who they were created to be, right? Uh, the typical process is get them in a Bible study, get them in a Sunday school class or a small group or whatever. Yes. and uh, Move them along the track. Yeah. Just hear, hear are the steps, right? As opposed to sort of an openness. Uh, now there's a journey, right? And we, uh, we're called to, to take that together. We need to listen to God, listen to each other, encourage one another on that journey towards becoming who we were meant to be. Um, uh, but there's, an, there, there's a new openness, I think, that we're called to, um, to help us on that journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think here's the thing is that doesn't negate the other mm. churches for good reasons and well-intentioned reasons come up with discipleship programs, mm. discipleship, mm -hmm. meaning to become a student of Jesus, to become yeah. more like Jesus and programs, which will systematically lead you through a mature understanding of what that faith is. Right. 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 So we have these discipleship programs, but the faith begins to switch mm. instead of trusting that. God mm -hmm. through these conversations yeah. and teachings and being in community and wrestling with who Jesus right. is. Um, that's where transformation begins yeah. over time. Church institution can put faith in the discipleship program that transforms yeah. rather than the slower right. pace of Holy mm -hmm. spirit transformation over yeah. time and through relationship. Right. right. And so both are good with mm -hmm. the intention in the right place. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and I think that there's, there's a place for, 
well, this is, I'm speaking from experience, right? Suffering, things like that, right? And, and the, those, those hard life experiences that you need people for, right? To, to, to support yeah. you in those mm-hmm. times. But those are the times. That's, I feel like that's where life transformation really happens. Yes, it happens in our church stuff to some degree. Really, that's just laying a foundation perhaps, right? Mm-hmm. Or it's um, you know, giving you some resources, so that when right. the stuff of life really happens, right, um, you can be open to letting God do what he wants to do in you. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it reminds me of the phrase that we've talked with this organization, the Table Network, mm-hmm. um, that we've worked closely with uh-huh. uh, over the last year or so. They talk about the church gathered and scattered. Mm, yeah, and yeah. so like the gathering together... Um, say at a church service is an important thing, but then the, uh-huh. the scattering that happens after that hour yeah. uh, of people actually living their lives yeah, and yeah. recognizing that God is in those moments That's in their right. life. And it's not just yeah. on that, yeah. on that Sunday morning. That's so right. the gathering is important, but um, totally. Totally. so is the rest of yeah. the, your seven days of your week or your six mm-hmm. days of your week. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sure. And that, the proximity of God is no more closer in that one hour with all the people yeah. than he is as you drive away in your Hyundai. That's right. Or the availability of God, right? Yeah. Or the availability right. of God. So right. that reminds me of this. Earlier in a thread, we talked about what are we going to talk about uh-huh. in a podcast? Yeah, yeah. Um, I imagine, you know, some some listeners, and we all listen to podcasts, and sometimes we hear teachers that we think are more, maybe more spiritual than us, more attuned to us. You mm-hmm. may even hear some crazy wackos in a treehouse that meet uh-huh. with pastors, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And they are, they're more spiritual, more connected with God than, uh-huh. than I am as I drive my Subaru over the speed limit listening yeah, to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, you brought out an interesting part of history oh, okay. where yeah. we have been talking about spaces, but yeah, you brought yeah. it to people. Do you remember that? And could yeah, you elaborate yeah. on so, that? So um, w- an area of interest for me has been um, uh, what we would call Christendom, partly, mostly because I'm interested in what's happening in the world right now. Why is the church, why is it, you know, there was a time when people just went to church, right? right? Most people, yeah. many people, um, but fewer and fewer people go to church, even Christians, right? (laughs) Don't go to church, or at least not what we have typically considered church, right? That 10 o'clock in the morning, Sunday, Sunday mornings, right? Um, So because uh, we've been, we've spent the last 1500 years or so in uh, an era of history that we have called, or we would call Christendom, right? It's a Christendom is not Christianity. It's, it's different. Christendom is a period in history where the world or the culture was, essentially officially Christian, right? Um, and that happened after, so I'm going to get kind of Official. historical Oh, here. yeah, you go, because this <laughs> is awesome. But I, I love that. Officially Christian. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Just the blank, blanket. It's just... Yeah. That's right. I, and that's true. And it was Western culture, yeah. right? And it, it mm-hmm. certainly wasn't the whole world. It was Western culture, right? So after Constantine, uh, emperor of, uh, of the Roman Empire in 3-something AD, became a Christian, um, right, prior to that... Um, it was risky to be a Christian. Um, and so if you were a follower of Jesus, like you better mean it, That's right. right? We're not messing um, around. Yeah. You're not like maybe following Jesus. Yeah. You're like, either I'm going to do right. this and maybe die or right. I'm out. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and it was been interesting, like uh, that you had to go through a, a two-year process of catechesis, they called it, teaching, before you could even go to church, right? Now we're just... Now, this is a different culture, right? Part of it is because of danger. They want to make sure that they're being infiltrated by people who are then going to arrest them and torture them, right? <laughs> so yeah. that, that's part of the culture. It's mm-hmm. their context. Um, it's a good background check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but, it, but it, it meant something. And then they mm. were tested not on what did they know about God, but how did they live their life, right? Mm. Um, so there was, there was a, an exam. But it, how do you treat the poor, right? How do you treat your spouse? Uh, are you honest in your business dealings, right? So a lot yeah. of these ordinary aspects of their life is what they were um, examined on how do you live your life in the ordinary parts of your life? Is God there too? Um, you look like you have uh, well, a Well, I'm, wow. I'm just ruminating on that uh-huh. because the, I mean, the stark shift in our culture away from behavior or life transformation or like how is this actually yeah. making me a different person yeah. towards head knowledge? Yes. Do, can I find Habakkuk in the Bible? Right. Or do I think that that's like right. maybe a weird back massaging thing? Right. I don't know. And, <laughs> and, the, and the reason, right, is because after Constantine became a Christian, all of a sudden... 
What do you think? Do you think it was um, a good idea to become a Christian <laughs> yeah. if the emperor has just become a Christian? Yes, <laughs> right? It's pro- hmm, maybe we should convert to Christianity too. So all of a sudden, right, the whole world, Western culture, is becoming Christian, and now the culture is officially Christian. Well, then, um, what happens to, um, to, to, to the mission of the church, right? The mission of the church prior to that was hey, let's love people into, into their loving God and Jesus. Now, well, everybody's a Christian, so what do we do now? Well, what we need to do is provide spiritual goods and services for all of the ordinary Christians, so we're going to create this clergy class. There were, there were, there were leaders before. There were bishops you know, before all that. But, um, but now you've got a division not mm-hmm. between the church and the world that the church is called to love, but you've got this division between the sacred clergy and the ordinary Everyday average person. Christian, everybody else. Yeah. And a new compartment. A new compartment. That right? space new was spiritual, that yeah. space was not, and now that That's person right. is more spiritual That's than right. that person. Now, what's kind of interesting is there was still a desire among some people to be more than just, like, th- they, there was a draw to be um, close to God, right? For, for not everybody, for, but for some. And so then they started these things called monasteries, right? For those who are like, I want to really be connected to God, right? So anyway, it's just a different, it was a different world. But, but what we had was this um, culture where you just, you're a Christian because you're born, right? Uh, <laughs> are you and, breathing? Yeah. You're a Christian. That's right. And missions was always on the other side of the world, right? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because you don't need to do missions in your own culture if everyone's a Christian. So anyway, so um, so there's this division between clergy and laity, right? The sacred people, special Christians, and the ordinary Christians. And the ordinary Christians need the special Christians in order to be connected to God, right? Mm-hmm. Through sacraments and through whatever they did on Sunday mornings at that time, right? So anyway, so now we're at the tail end of that era of history where it's Mm. like there's still some who are holding on you know to that way of doing Mm. church Mm -hmm. um but i think it's it's dying you know and so i look at you guys and uh you're doing church in a very different way if you want to call it church even um and so uh you know i i think about a hundred years from now i think i was talking with cody about this last week a hundred years from now or 200 years from now, are people going to look back and say, boy, wasn't that interesting? There's that time in history when the only way you could, you know, worship God was by going to church on Sunday mornings. And now yeah. hardly anybody does that anymore. Right. Wow, <laughs> so yeah. what is Christianity going to look like a hundred or 200 years from now as we perhaps let go of some of those typical ways of doing things? I don't know, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think, so that's part of the open handedness um, is, being open to new ways of of doing church like you guys are. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> My wow, little that was history, great. history lesson. <laughs> That's cool. That's a to hear where it where it all comes from and, yeah. and like you can you can pinpoint this this place in history where where like it seems like it all kind of turned around for who who knows if it was for the better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mean now or yeah. then? Then. Oh, yeah, then. right. And, and I, you know, and so I, I feel like I, I should say, I'm not saying that God wasn't at work there, you know. Sure. Right? Sure. Um, uh, for sure he was. But there's always human humanity, right? And we, um, we mess things up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? So sometimes we think when there's an alternative product in the kingdom, or say there's an alternative product in the market. Mm-hmm. We, we say that the, uh, the alternative product is uh, competition mm. to the product that, mm-hmm. that you're selling in the, yeah, in the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes creative expressions of church, whether it be in a brewery, winery, uh-huh. park, treehouse, yep. um, can be seen as a competitive product in, yeah. in the kingdom. Wow. What I love about what you're saying is that... Um, is that this mm-hmm. what what we get to be about and what you've been you've been on this journey with uh-huh. us I know that you've been <laughs> chiming in all along the way and yeah. you've been a part of even our earliest conversations of us figuring out oh, yeah. what this is right yeah. um it's always been seen in your eyes what we hope others will see that this is an extension of the kingdom of God, yeah. not an alternative product that's yeah, seen as competition right. to what you do on Sunday. Right, right. Because what I love is, Marcus, is with your journey, one, there's two things I would love to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, 
with your journey, I know that your messages are different now oh, yeah. than they were 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and not just because of a different passage on Sunday, yeah, yeah. but your intention for what people leave with mm-hmm. after that hour mm-hmm. is different than what it was 10 years ago. Yeah. What, what would you say that is? And then I'll give you my yeah. second question. So um, uh, the way I think about it, uh, Henry Nouwen in his book, Life of the Beloved, a book that I read during a very difficult and dark time a couple, a few years ago when I was uh, going through that final year at my last church. Um, he, uh, he said, um, when you discover yourself to be God's beloved, uh, all you want is for other people to know that they too are God's beloved. And mm. so, Amen. I f- yeah, I feel like that's kind of where I, uh, I've landed on that. Uh, like during, if it, there's another, I, there's a whole story there too, but I've discovered myself to be God's beloved in a way that I could never have found that had I not been through what I went through. And, uh, and that's it. I just want people to know that they are unconditionally loved. And look, I believed all this before, but it's like I understand it in a way different way. Like no matter what, you don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to be a certain way to be loved by God. And then, and hopefully my, my goal is for me to love that way too, right? You don't have to prove yourself. Um, you don't have to, yeah, uh, you don't have to try. I like that song. Was, who, who sings that? You don't have to try, 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 right? <laughs> uh, I, I think of that as a message from God. You don't have to try, 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 try. You are just loved and welcomed and you belong. Um, so that's that's how my, I would say my, what was the second part of your question? Oh, now I remember. Okay, I'm going to get back to it. Oh, okay. You guys chime in. I'm going to figure out the second part. <laughs> I, have, I have one thing. Okay. You, uh, you, you sent me something recently about um, doing spiritual formation in a church, and mm-hmm. it was like a, a little guide that you had written. Oh. And there was something in there that, that uh, struck me about what you're measuring. And you talked about, I think it was something along the lines, measuring attendance or measuring impact. Mm-hmm. And you gave you the example of the church that you're pastoring right oh, now. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. That's a very small church, yeah. but you guys are having some big impact. Can you talk about yeah, yeah, what that sure. impact is? Um, so the church that I am currently pastoring, I, I'd started there as a guest pastor just about once or twice a month for about a year before becoming there. I'm an interim pastor there. Um, <clears throat> and I met with them after church, some of their leaders, and, uh, you know, I was presenting some of our Fleur San Diego uh, stuff to them, and, and they were really into this conversation. And I said, you know, you've got this great church here. It's it's small, but it's uh, it's good. It's clean. You know, it's a good facility. And... Um, and I said, you know, what do you guys do besides church on Sunday mornings? And they kind of looked at each other. They're like, oh, hmm, um, yeah, not, not, nothing really. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, maybe there's something you could do. And so a few of them started thinking and they tried a few different things. And finally, what they landed on was this food pantry that they started about nine months ago now awesome. for a, a community. So it's a community of uh, 800 households. So very, very small community. Lots of food insecurity in this place. There's mm-hmm. no grocery store in this town. So if you don't have a, wow. a car, the best thing you can get is at the Circle K, mm-hmm. right? So uh, not a lot of health. Um, uh, so anyway, challenges in terms of food, uh, poverty, and so they started this food pantry, and every week now they serve 100 out of the 800 households in, wow. in Westmoreland. It's incredible. This is amazing, right? Um, and so, uh, so I, I love that because they are now participating with God in yes. bringing shalom into the world, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. In Dude. a way that they had, and not that they hadn't been before, but in, in a way that I think they have been made for. I mean, this church is like this is prime for them right they're they've got the resources they've got the place um and they can do it and they're doing it so it's really exciting yeah, yeah. what yeah. have you seen what has that done for their lives so their excitement i actually uh on my podcast i interviewed yeah. the lady who started kind of was the the awesome. key person mm-hmm. uh for this um uh, food pantry and one of the things she said was that um the people that they're serving are becoming our friends Right. So as opposed to the wealthier white and it's it's a it's a right. These are farmers. They're like business owners. Right. So they're wealthier than a lot of the folks in the town. But rather than, well, we're the rich white people serving the poor Hispanic people. Now 
we're just people who are becoming friends with other people, mm. right? Oh, and we're sharing. Oh, so good. Yeah. So isn't that cool? I love that. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. just at a breakfast this morning where he talked about how the presence of Jesus brings unity. Where there mm. were two, it's from Ephesians, yeah. where there were two, Jesus makes them one. Mm. And where there was socioeconomic divide yeah. there, yeah. Jesus is now yeah. making this That's family right. a friend. That's right. I love That's that. right. Good. So, I thought, that's oh, awesome. Oh, I thought of my second part oh, okay, for, for Marcus. And this is, what do you do with hurt? Because mm. so many, I'm sure we all have friends that, that fall into these stories. Um, and so many of our listeners do too. When you are hurt yeah. by church or when mm. you are hurt or damaged by religious institution, yeah, yeah. Um, many people not only leave that, but they leave their relationship and yeah, faith in yeah, God yeah. behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You went through hurt and damage by a church institution, but left with an alive faith in Jesus that led you further yeah, on. Yeah, right. How, how was how that for that? you, and why did you not throw out God with the bathwater? Yeah, well, I think for me, because uh, church and God are not the same thing, right? Um, God is God, right? God is love. God, um, God is unconditional acceptance. Church is our human attempt at doing that too, right? And sometimes it's, it does not go well. <laughs> um, and so I think part of it for me was um, that I was able to keep those things uh, uh, separate, right? God, uh, just because the church was doing this to me doesn't mean that God was doing sure. this to me. Um, and then the other part of it for me was just sort of, you know, I read some great books like the Henry Nouwen uh, book, um, Life of the Beloved, and um, Surrender to Love by David Benner, um, and then Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro, um, which talks about, you know, when you have been hurt, um, that's, well, I, I don't know if I want to go on, but basically it just helped me to embrace, in some ways you have to embrace the pain, let it let it become a part of you and let God heal that in you. That's what, that's, mm. that was my experience anyway. I, I had to just say, okay, Lord, this is, this is my journey. This is my pain. This is my suffering. And, um, and I surrender it to you. Um, and, uh, and that was all before I even got voted out. <laughs> right? And so if what's funny is by the time I got voted out, I was like, Oh, good. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to go. Uh, what's next? Um, but anyway, um, yeah, you just have to, uh, for me anyway, I had to, um, I had to surrender that to God and I had to say, God, I, I invite you into my pain. Right. And, and, uh, and you did not do this to me. Right. These particular people, it wasn't even the whole church. It was a few people in this church that, that did most of the damage, you know, and, and I don't know what's going on in their life. They've probably been hurt in ways too, and now they're acting out in a way that, yeah, you know, whatever. It, it, it's a response to the the hurt that they felt in their life, and you know, one of the hardest thing for me, or a, a challenging thing for me, I was listening to a podcast by Pete Scazzaro, who wrote "Emotionally Healthy Spirituality," and he said in one of his uh, episodes, he said, "Do you pray that God would bless your enemies or the people who've hurt you?" And I was like, "Ugh, I don't want to do that," <laughs> and so I was like, "Okay." All right, Lord, I pray that you bless the people that hurt me. I don't mean it, but I'll pray it for now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know it's right. Yeah. And so, um, but I, I've tried to keep praying that prayer, and I do. And, and you know, the more you pray it, the more you're able to mean it. So I kind of, I'd say I mean it like 75% now. <laughs> but that's part of the healing process too, yeah, right? It's right. forgiving mm -hmm. and, and surrendering that to God and praying that God would be with those that have hurt us. Yeah. And bring healing to their lives. Cause really that's what they need too. They need healing too. Yeah. God, thanks yeah. for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Well, we're, we're about out of time as far as this episode goes, mm -hmm. but we like talking to you. Oh, good. I like talking <laughs> to you. Yes. <laughs> We'd love so to, much. we'll create, we'll, uh, we'll get a link out to okay. your, to your podcast. Cool. 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 Um, we'll get a link out to, a couple, if not all three or four of those, those books that you listed. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great. As well. And, yeah. um, cause that would just be great for anyone yeah. who heard this and was sparked mm, and yeah. is wondering, okay, I want to be emotionally, spiritually healthy. Yeah. How is that? It'd right. be great to go. Right. 
Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thanks thank for, you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Uh, right. <laughs> I came into this thinking, I don't know what I'm going to say today. And, <laughs> hey, there was plenty to talk about. That's, That's awesome. That's right. <laughs> I know. I even have more questions. We'll have to save it for another yeah, time. Yeah. Yes. Do this again with us. Okay, for, for sure. sure. For and sure. Um, make sure to grab a little cup of Fruit Loops on the way oh, out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we didn't have any Fruit Loops. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, you can find us at UncommonGoodSD.com. Find links to our events, links to this podcast, uh, links to all the cool stuff that we've been writing over the last year or so uh, and anything that's coming up anytime soon. And uh, you can just get more information. But really, if you want to engage with us, the best place is our social media, especially Instagram, at UncommonGoodSD. And that's also our Twitter and Facebook. You can find us there. Thanks for being here. Peace.